you. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. So um, I'm going to try to use the slides to tell a story and the whiteboard to write mathematics. So um, that way you can remember. It doesn't disappear if I write it on the board. So maybe you can remember it better. So, um, so first of all, um, the word moonshine, uh, well, in mathematics, it means strange connections between finite groups and modular forms. And uh, so it's somehow moonshine should form some kind of a bridge between these two worlds of symmetry and um, number theory. So, um, and emphasis should be on strange. So these connections should not be a sort of general theory. They should be some sort of exceptional things. So if you have infinitely many cases of some phenomenon, then you probably shouldn't call it moonshine. You should just call it you know, a general theory. So um, in fact, this, and the reason is because some history of moonshine, it started out with some, uh, well, so the word moonshine, as it's used here, comes from an English expression, moonshine in the water, from the 1400s, I think. Um, and that just meant, like, if you're looking at a pond and you see the moon in it, then um, that's not the real moon. You're looking at some sort of a, an image. And, and that evolved into an expression that means nonsense or foolish talk. So moonshine should be something that's strange and unexpected. So first, I'll start by talking about monstrous moonshine. There's a classification of finite simple groups. Um, and you have these four classes. And the last class, there's only finitely many objects in it, 26 sporadic simple groups. And the largest one is the monster. It has about 8 times 10 to the 53rd elements. That's about the number of protons in Jupiter. Um, now, this group looks large, but in fact, it's not that large. I mean, if you took, say, a standard deck of 52 playing cards, then it's group of permutations is significantly larger than the monster. But it's something that you can work with explicitly. If somebody were to give you two permutations, you could sit down and multiply them pretty quickly. Um, the special thing about the monster is that it has no small representations. So, if you were to take a permutation representation, well, the smallest one available has about 10 to the 20th objects. And if you were to look at linear representations, um, you would need to start at dimension 196,883 to get a faithful representation. So we have 1, 196,883, 2, 1, 2, 9, 6, 8, 7, 6, and another 191 of them. Okay, so the other side of moonshine is um, a theory of genus zero modular functions. In particular, these objects called Haupt modules. So Haupt module is, um, it's a holomorphic function. It's invariant under some discrete subgroup that acts on the upper half plane. And the quotient is genus zero. The gen so it's invariant under a genus zero group and it generates the function field of this object. So a Haupt module for gamma is a function that takes h mod gamma to c minus finitely many points. And it sort of witnesses this isomorphism. OK, so in particular, the j function is a Haupt module for SL2z. And it has this Fourier expansion, q inverse plus 196884q and 2149376 0q squared, and so on. So if we were to name this chi1, chi2, chi3, well, people noticed in the 1970s that these coefficients were relatively simple combinations of these characters. So in particular, this first coefficient is the sum of chi1 and chi2. The next coefficient is the sum of the first three. And the coefficient after that is the sum of two times the first one, two times the second one, and um, 
and then another two. So um, the question is, maybe there's some sort of a pattern here. And so what is now known as the mackay thompson conjecture is that there is some natural graded representation of the monster such that this graded dimension written as a power series is equal to the J function. So mackay thompson say that there exists a natural graded representation with an action of the monster um, such that, um, yeah, so this is this J function with zero constant term. So um, now, obviously, this sort of hinges on the word natural, but um, we're going to pretend that we can recognize such an object when we see it. So the idea for constructing such an object is that, well, we can form a bridge between the monster and the J function using some objects, some infinite dimensional objects from representation theory, or if you're a physicist, you would say it comes from conformal field theory. And so this was done in 1988, about 10 years after the initial discovery. They constructed a vertex operator algebra. So not just a graded vector space, it's a, it's a graded vector space with some additional multiplication structure. They constructed a vertex operator algebra, which they called V natural because they claimed it was natural. And uh, it's also known as the moonshine module. And it has this property that its graded dimension is J and its automorphism group as a vertex operator algebra is the monster. So the graded dimension, so V natural is a vertex operator algebra. And the graded dimension is J, and the automorphism group is the monster. So that is the key construction. Now, there is a more refined correspondence. Because this object, or at least back then it was a conjectural object, because it had monster symmetry, we could, instead of looking at graded dimension, which we can think of as the trace of the identity element, we can look at graded traces of non-identity elements. So Thompson suggested this around the same time as the initial conjecture. And Conway and Norton did a massive computation and came up with experimental evidence that there is, that the graded traces are modular functions as well, but they're not modular functions j they because this is you know it's not a it's not a trivial representation it's um you get other genus zero functions you get other haupt modules so so the monster moonshine conjecture is let's see so monster moonshine for V natural, if we go in an ace historic way, monster moon for V natural is that the sum of the traces of any G on V natural N times Q to the N minus one is a helped module. In fact, in their paper, they wrote down all the candidate functions for all of the conjugacy classes. So the first proof of this, well, it's, it's not actually a complete proof. They, um, they sh showed more or less that a virtual representation of the monster exists that yields the desired functions. This just comes from doing computations sufficiently large up to some Sturmian bound and then showing that um, you know, multiplicity functions, there exists some modular functions of suitable level that exist. Well, anyway, this is... Um, there's no construction, and they actually didn't quite finish their proof. So um, anyway, we don't really pay much attention to that. The second proof is from Borchardt. He showed that for this object, V natural, the trace, graded trace functions are the ones that were 
calculated by Conway and Norton. So Borchardt's proof has the following outline. Um, I'll just sh roughly sketch the outline. So here's V natural, the construction, and there's a functor here, which physicists would call ad torus and quantize. And from a vertex algebra, you can get a Lie algebra. Okay, so what's important here is that this is a functor, and so it takes the monster symmetry here to monster symmetry on the Lie algebra. So, so on the left side, we get a Lie algebra with monster symmetry. Okay, on the right side, there is an automorphic infinite product. This, the particular automorphic infinite product that appeared in Borchardt's proof was the Koeken norton zagier formula, which concerns the J function. Um, maybe I'll say more about that later. And from this product formula, you can form a Lie algebra by a method using generators and relations. So we get a sort of combinatorial construction of a Lie algebra. And so this Lie algebra is distinguished by the fact that it has something like good shape. Okay, so we have a Lie algebra with monster symmetry and we have a Lie algebra that's somehow shaped well. And the fact that they are isomorphic then gives us a Lie algebra that both has good shape and it has good symmetry. And so from that you can deduce some recursion relations on traces of elements. And this gives you, um, well, eventually you get a result that these are the genus zero functions conjectured by Conway and Norton. So there are additional moonshine phenomena um, that were not completely explained by Borchardt's proof. So first of all, there's a, um, some work of Og in the early 1970s. So he showed that the primes P such that this quotient of X naught of P by the Fricke involution, um, the primes such that this is genus zero are these 15 primes. And if you just do some, it's a pretty short exercise with the bad fiber, you can show that these are the primes such that all super singular elliptic curves over FP have J invariant in FP. You can just sort of, um, so over FP, X naught of P looks like two copies of X naught of one glued together at singul super singular points. If you mod out by this freaking involution, then you just sort of get one copy of X naught of one, but any super singular point gets glued to its Frobenius conjugate. So if you have anything that's um, not in FP, then you'll get some sort of gluing and the genus will go up. Okay, so Og's Jack Daniels problem. So at the end of his paper, he, he offered a bottle of Jack Daniels for anyone. This is a whiskey. Um, he offers a bottle of Jack to anyone who can explain why these primes are exactly the ones that divide the order of the monster. And so Borchardt's half solved this problem. For each prime dividing the order of the monster, there is a conjugacy class called PA of elements of order P um, such that this um, derated trace function TG is a Haupt module for this um, genus zero curve. And so this shows that any prime dividing the order of the monster gives us uh, a genus zero X naught of P plus. And so the opposite question is, why is, the, is there a good reason why these genus zero curves, all of these primes land inside this group. And so um, that's really a more philosophical question and we don't have a very good explanation. It's just the monster is very big. So anyway, um, Og actually offered a bottle of Jack to Borchardt's but he refused because he thought it was only half solved. And also he doesn't like Jack Daniels. So there's another phenomenon Um, for any G in this conjugacy class PA, the coefficients of this graded trace function are all non-negative integers. So I should call this TG of tau. Um, 
For example, in the class 2a, you have this function here, which is a Hauck module for gamma naught of 2 plus. Now, this extra phenomena has been, OK, so in addition to just being non-negative integers, it turns out that they appear to be, they, uh, they behave like um, original monstrous moonshine, but for smaller groups. They appear to be dimensions of representations of centralizers in the monster. For this uh, class 2a, the centralizer is an extension of the baby monster sporadic group, the second largest sporadic group, by a group of order 2. And it has irreducible representations of the following dimensions. There's 1, there's 43, 71, and these larger elements. And if you look, if you compare these two exp the expansions and the dimensions, it's difficult to resist the temptation to combine these representations to form coefficients. Now, in fact, so we can ask, maybe there is a graded representation for these elements. And in fact, there were two explanations conjectured. So the first one was generalized moonshine. This is a conjecture by Norton in 1987. So um, he conjectured that there is some graded representation of the centralizer such that, um, so generalized moonshine. says um, there exists a graded representation of the centralizer of G. Um, so this, this representation is called VG. And furthermore, um, he asked that traces of centralizing elements, I'll call it ZGH tau, trace of a centralizing element, on V of G um, and he asked that this would be um, a Haupt module. And the second is modular moonshine. And this says that, well, there are graded representations, VP, um, also representations of um, CMG, but now they are going to be uh, characteristic P. So these are representations over, in fact, the finite field of P elements. And, well, if you have an automorphism of a FP vector space, um, well, if you try to take its trace, you just get some number that's mod p. That's not very interesting. Um, however, if you have an element whose order is prime to p, that is to say a p regular element, then its eigenvalues are roots of unity. And so you can lift those roots of unity to a characteristic zero and then sum those, and then you get a trace that is characteristic zero value. Those are called Brouwer characters. And um, so the claim is that these Brouwer characters are also genus zero functions. Okay, so, um, so the history of these conjectures is the following, very roughly. So for generalized moonshine, the objects were proved to exist in 1997, um, but then actually showing that we get Haupt modules, well, that took until a few years ago. Whereas in modular moonshine, assuming these objects exist, Borchards and Riba showed that um, we get genus zero modular functions, but then existence of the objects was trickier, and that took until last year. And so you might ask what happened in the intervening time between this initial um, substantial developments until the um, final proofs in recent years. And that is, well, the theory of vertex operator algebras was not quite mature enough to solve these conjectures back in the 90s. And so what we had was 20 years of developments. And in particular, the key development that we needed was a theory of cyclic orbifolds. So I will 
briefly describe this theory. Um, so what is uh, vertex operator algebra? They, these objects have a reputation for being rather awful, horrible objects. Um, and that's pretty well earned. Anyway, but what you have is a vector space, an identity element, and another extra virasoro element, which I won't discuss much. Um, and there's a multiplication operation. So if you had an ordinary algebra, you would have a vector space with a multiplication operation, and maybe if it's unital, an identity element. But the difference is the multiplication operation in a vertex operator algebra takes values not in V, but in formal Laurent series with coefficients in V. So that's some extra complication. And then they satisfy some axioms, like there's an identity element. Left multiplication by identity gives you, well, it acts like the identity. Right multiplication is almost like the identity, but there's some sort of extra fluff that's in positive powers of z. Um, and there's, well, virus or element gives you an action of some nice Lie algebra. Um, and then there's a commutativity and associativity axiom, which I won't write because it's, it really is awful. And finally, um, there's just sort of a finiteness axiom here. So we don't need to worry too much about it, but just think of it as a graded vector space with a multiplication map. And so the basic example, in fact, the one that motivated the definition of these objects um, comes from even positive definite lattices. If you have such an object, then you can form this infinite dimensional vector space. You take the group ring and you tensor it with this sort of um, symmetric algebra. So this piece on the right is more or less as big as a polynomial ring. And you're sort of taking a polynomial ring in polynomial rings. And so it, it's big and infinite dimensional, but um, it's not super bad. I'm not going to write down the multiplication operation because um, that's a little horrifying. Anyway, the graded dimension of this object, this um, group ring sort of, elements of the group ring seem to have a, a degree related to their um, norm. And so that's what gives us a theta function. And then this symmetric algebra also has some degrees attached to x. And so that gives us a uh, reciprocal of the eta function. And so for the leech lattice, for example, um, we get this um, graded dimension that's equal to j plus 24. So it's almost the same graded dimension as um, this vertex operator algebra v natural. So vertex operator algebras have a notion of modules. Um, there's a sort of left action, except the action map, instead of a module over a normal algebra, it, it would map to m, but here it maps to formal Laurent series with coefficients in m. Again, this compatibility is a little more complicated than the usual compatibility you expect from an action of a algebra. Um, but anyway, the key point is that there is a notion of holomorphic vertex operator algebra, and those are um, the ones with the most boring possible representation theory. That is to say, all modules are just direct sums of V itself. So the category of modules is just equivalent to the category of finite dimensional vector spaces. Um, and so our first example with module, with uh, lattices, there's a theorem that says um, a lattice vertex algebra, well, the modules are just um, direct sums of, well, there's modules that come from uh, translating by elements of this, um, of the dual lattice. And so in particular, uh, a lattice vertex algebra is holomorphic if and only if the lattice itself is unimodular. So for example, the Leech lattice is a holomorphic vertex operator algebra. And so the cyclic orbifold theory is the following. Um, so there's a theorem, Van Eckeren, Muller, and Scheithauer, which is that well, if V is holomorphic, and G is a suitable element of order 
n. Um, I'm going to ignore the anomaly free condition. Then there exists some sort of a generalized vertex operator algebra. And it's graded by z mod nz. Vij. Okay. And secondly, there's a pair of commuting automorphisms. So g and g star act on v on gv. Here g is, this g here is just a lift of the g on v itself to this larger structure. And it de the eigenspaces for g and g star give us decomposition into these vijs. And we have an isomorphism. v is the direct sum of gvi0. And we have another holomorphic vertex operator algebra, which we call v mod g. This is called the cyclic orbifold dual. And this is 0j. So this is, the picture is something like, we have a z mod nz cross z mod nz graded object. And somehow our original object is this um, i comma 0. I ordered my axes wrong. The original object is something like v i comma 0. And then our new object is something like v 0 comma j here. So they showed how to construct this thing. And that was really what we needed to build everything else. So the special case of this construction was, in fact, predated it for, by quite a long time. The construction of this um, moonshine module was done by this process, where g has order 2. If you take the minus 1 automorphism of the leech lattice, you can lift it to an, an order 2 automorphism of the vertex operator algebra. And then this orbifold method will give you the moonshine module. Now, in fact, there are 51 algebraic conjugacy classes of elements in the Leech lattice, which will give you the Moonshine module. There are something like 160 classes of elements in the Leech lattice, and taking cyclic orbifolds for those will yield, um, well, lots and lots of different vertex operator algebras, but 51 of them will give us the Moonshine module. So generalized moonshine, the full conjecture is the following. It doesn't talk about elements of prime order. It talks about all possible elements. It says for any element in the monster, you can get some graded projective representation of the centralizer. And, um, and it says for any commuting pair of elements, we will get a holomorphic function on the upper half plane. And so, the conditions are the following. So first, well, these two data are related in the following way. This holomorphic function is just the graded trace of an element. So z of g h tau is just the sum of a trace. And second, well, this um, z, that is to say, if we conjugate the inputs simultaneously, say conjugation in the monster, we should get the same function up to a scalar multiplication. So that is to say, this is something like a class function, but it's not a class function on elements of G. It's a class function on commuting pairs in this monster. So third, we ask that this function, z g h tau, is constant or a Haupt module. And the fourth is that it's an SL2z condition 
for any A, B, C, D in SL2Z, we ask that um, Z of G, H, A tau plus B over C tau plus D, that is to say the transform of Z under SL2Z is proportional. There's some non-zero scalar multiple of Z, G to the A, H to the C, G to the B, H to the D, tau. So SL2Z can transform um, these complex numbers on the right, but it can also transform these input elements on the left because they are commuting elements. Because they commute, they correspond to a homomorphism from Z cross Z, and so SL2Z will act on that. So finally, there's a, there's a condition that keeps us from cheating and using trivial representations everywhere. It says that Z of G H tau is J if and only if um, G and H are trivial. So that forces us to have non-trivial representations. So we can ask whether we can brute force a solution. We could try to say compute all commuting pairs, write down all possible um, genus zero functions, and maybe just compare them and look at character tables. Well, we're not quite there yet, maybe just because um, nobody really wants to try. But anyway, we haven't classified commuting pairs of elements in the monster, and we still don't know character tables of all of these elements. So an exhaustive computation at the moment is still out of reach. So instead, we want to find um, a meaning. We need an, an interpretation of these objects. That is to say, we want to know what sort of stuff is this VG and what sort of a function is this um, is Z. And so physicists came up with an explanation quite quickly. So this is the year after the conjecture was proposed. Some physicists, Dixon, Ginsburg, and Harvey, um, they said um, this, well, this, this space is the space of twisted, well, it's a twisted sector. It's a Hilbert space of a twisted sector of a conformal field theory. And um, the functions are partition functions with twisted boundary conditions. So all of these claims, except for number three, one, two, four, and five, more or less follow up to physical levels of rigor from conformal field theory reasoning. And so there's an algebraic interpretation now, which is VG is something called a G-twisted module. And these partition functions are, well, we can just define it using this trace. So there's a geometric interpretation of this function Z as a GH twisted partition function. Well, um, the commuting pair G and H gives a homomorphism from pi one of an elliptic curve to the monster. Pi one of an elliptic curve is just Z cross Z. And so SL2Z action will change the pair that generates Z cross Z or pi one. So if we ignore scalar ambiguities, um, this says more or less that Z is a function on the moduli space of elliptic curves with principal, modular, uh, sorry, principal monster bundles. So that's at least a reasonably nice uh, interpretation. And, um, and so one consequence of this fact, which I won't write about until later, is that um, this moduli space, or rather functions on this moduli space, admit a notion of Hecke operators. And this will, this will be uh, a key point in the proof. So the first breakthrough in this proof was by Donnelly and Mason. They showed that these modules, these twisted modules exist, and they're unique up to isomorphism. And they also showed that these graded traces um, converge on the upper half plane. So this more or less, by some general nonsense, is settled claims one, this conjugation invariance, and this non-triviality. And the SL2Z 
This proportionality claim was reduced to a claim of G rationality. And G rationality is, amounts to the, the following claim, which was proved a couple years ago. The category of G twisted V natural modules is semi simple. That is to say, there's no non trivial extensions. And so that resolves this claim. So um, now this claim uh, for three is um, it's a little trickier. We don't have a physical interpretation. However, what we do have is Borchard's original proof. So we can try to follow that with suitable alterations. And so Hohen actually did that for one case. He did this for the baby monster. And so, and his proof gives an outline for proving this claim in general. So this is their program. It looks remarkably like the outline that I drew of Richard Borchardt's proof of the monstrous moonshine conjecture. So on the left hand side, we have some sort of generalized vertex algebra. This is the construction that was um, given by this theorem here. So this VG is this abelian intertwining algebra. And by some factorial method, we get a Lie algebra here that has an action of a central extension. So we get a Lie algebra. with action of a centralizer, but this time it's central extension. Okay, and on the right side, again, we get a Lie algebra with good shape. That is to say, it's something that we understand its simple roots. We understand the homology of the positive subalgebra. Um, various calculational tools can then go forward. And then we show that they're isomorphic, and then by some recursion relations, we show that we get genus zero functions. So um, what sort of objects do we have here? We had some infinite products. These are now known as Borchard's products, and they have the following form. Tg of tau minus Tg of minus one over tau has this, um, it's this infinite product where the exponents are coefficients of a vector valued modular function. This vector valued modular function can be formed from these Tg taus, except now we have um, powers of G. So, um, and then from this, we, we sort of form a Lie algebra. This becomes the um, vial denominator formula for an infinite dimensional Lie algebra. And these, um, these coefficients here are dimensions of root spaces. Okay, so I should say in the, in the trivial element case, which is Borchardt's proof, we have the following, um, we have the Koike Norton Zagier formula. So it's named this because Koike and Norton and Zagier, oops, sorry, um, all proved it during the 1980s, but they proved it independently and no one bothered to write it up. J of tau is the sum of C of n, Q to the n. So we have a product formula where this um, C, this exponent, just comes from the J function. Now what is remarkable about this product formula is that the left side is just a power series in P and Q. So there's no mixed terms on the left side. There's no p to the fifth times q to the seventh. Okay, but on the right side, it looks like there's a lot of mixed terms, and so they all cancel. And this is what gives us our um, recursion relations. So, for example, if you just expand this for a little while, the fact that the p q squared term vanishes. is equivalent to saying that this uh, q to the four term of the j function is equal to the third term plus the first term choose two. 
Okay. And what does that mean? Um, well, this gives us an isomorphism of vector spaces in the Lie algebra. We find that V4 is isomorphic to V3 plus V1, sorry, exterior square of V1. So normally if you have a Lie algebra and you get this sort of formula, you just get an isomorphism of vector spaces. However, this Lie algebra has an action of the monster. And so we get an isomorphism as monster representations. And so that is a um, key point. And so from this, you can get some sort of a, um, trace, form, a, a trace formula, like, um, how do we say this? Trace of G on V4 is trace of G on V3 plus trace of G on V1 squared minus trace of G squared on V1 divided by two. I'm sorry for the mess. So this way, the trace of G on V4 is determined by lower order terms. And in fact, this sort of formula gives you a way of computing all of the terms once you get maybe five or seven of them. Okay, anyway, so there's this functor. I won't say too much about it because um, this is a number theory conference. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, so we get two borchardt cuts moody Lie algebras and they turn out to be isomorphic and just by matching root multiplicities showing that they are both the same vector valued modular form. And by transport of structure, we get a action of a central extension of the centralizer. So the end of the proof is the following. Um, so there's some sort of Lie algebra homology calculation and we find that there's some HECA operators um, that well, we can define Hecke operators on functions like this um, by this formula. So instead of just, so if you didn't have a G and H, you could just have you know, the usual Hecke operator on genus, uh, sorry, weight zero functions. But um, here we have this sort of extra G and H that sort of come up and they come naturally from thinking of this function as a function on a moduli space of elliptic curves with torsors. Um, Heck operator just comes, whoops, comes from a sum over isogenies and pulling back torsors. So anyway, these Heck operators act, they turn, sorry, TN ZGH is going to be a monic polynomial in ZGH for all N. It's gonna be a monic polynomial of degree N. And just from that condition, we can show that we get a genus zero modular function. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's sort of a key point, the, the fact that we get monic polynomials from HEC operators, and that gives us a, a genus zero function. So um, then there's, there's something about constant functions. This gives us the final claim. So next, I'm gonna talk about modular moonshine. I have two minutes, so I'll just say, there's a conjecture. We get a vertex algebra over FP, um, and Brouwer characters are Haupt modules. So they interpreted this FP object as Tate cohomology of some self-dual integral form of the monster module. And so they showed that if this exists, then this works as a candidate representation. And then this was shown to exist last year. So how do you construct such a self-dual integral form? Existing constructions require some denominators. Orbit, the orbifold constructions all require some one over n's. And so what we do is just lots of orbifold constructions of different orders and then glue them together using um, descent. That's about it. So we can ask, is there a way to put these two conjectures together? Well, we get the same P regular characters on both this characteristic zero and characteristic P object. And um, in fact, this works for pretty much any element of the monster, but sometimes they don't match. So when can we get some integral structure that produces both? Well, one problem is that sometimes first cohomology is zero. And this happens if and only if we get some pole at zero. So we have fricate objects and non-fricate elements. There's 141 fricate classes, 53 non-fricate classes. 
and they satisfy some very interesting phenomena. So um, non-negative coefficients means you get a Fricke object, Fricke class pulls at zero, we get Fricke from generalized moonshine, and the orbifolds are v-natural if it's Fricke and the Leech lattice if it's not Fricke. Anyway, Borchardt has this conjecture about um, forming modules over z adjoin a root of unity. Um, so we ask that these modules, if you tensor with c, you get a twisted module. If you tensor with z mod nz, then you should get this um, modular moonshine object. And so right now we can say we get objects over this ring. We have a 1 over n, but we don't know how to remove it. Um, so we need, it would be nice if we had some canonical lifts of these mod n objects to characteristic 0. And it would also be nice if we had some meaningful interpretation of these objects. So uh, that is all. Thank you. Yes. So the eyes are each other. Yes. So what goes into proving that the eyes um, So once you show that they are Borchard's cuts Moody Lie algebras, then the question of their isomorphism just amounts to showing that root multiplicities are equal. So, yeah. Well, it's not that numerical. You just you show that both of them have root multiplicities given by a vector-valued modular form. I'm sorry. So, concerning this unification you mentioned, so how much is proved? So, this. So, well, let's see. When n equals one, that is the identity element, then we get, um, then we just have the self-dual integral form, v, v natural. Okay. Um, for all other elements, I think. Maybe for some element element of order two or so, or maybe an element of order three, we might have candidate objects. But aside from that, it's it's very hard to get something over such a small ring. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, I mean, we, we have these objects VG over C, uh -huh, uh -huh. and we have these um, these take cohomology objects over Z mod NZ, but gluing them together is tricky. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes? Yes. Yes. Of how? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, so if G is in the class 2A, then we get uh, Q inverse plus, um, sorry, if, sorry, G equals 1 and H is in the class 2A, then we get uh, Q inverse plus 4372Q plus 96256Q squared. And this is gamma not a 2 plus, yeah. And so uh, by this SL2Z, sorry, I didn't write it. From this SL2Z condition, we also find that if G is in 2A and H is 1, then we get um, the, the minus 1 over tau transformation. So we get Q to the minus 1 half plus 437 to q to the one half plus nine six two five six q plus and so on, and um, and then if if both are in two a, then we get this q inverse minus four hundred ninety two q minus two two three nine zero q cubed minus and so on. This is a um, square root of j of two tau minus seven seventeen twenty eight. Uh, yeah, so this, yeah, this is gamma not of four invariant, but it's also invariant under a, a, a slightly larger group. <laughs>